Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you tonight. We give thanks to you as your children in Jesus. You showed us your great love for us in Christ, and we delight ourselves in you. Tonight, God, I want to lift you up, lift up everyone that is a part of this study to you. May your grace and mercy follow them all the days of their life. I'm so grateful for the family family we have in Christ. I pray that your word would speak to our hearts and that we would get an understanding and that you would be glorified. I pray the Spirit helps us because without your help, God, we can do nothing. I pray for new doors open up and I pray that you would lead us and guide us through it all. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace, which we do not deserve. We know you are working all things together for good. I give praise to you in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. I'll whip out the notes. I know you told me once, what are we in Romans something? Romans 3, and we're going to be in verse 21 to 26. Not that this matters. I'm just curious. What uh, version are you using? I, I've been using the New King James Version. Okay. Yeah, and so um, just so you kind of know how we, we do things, I... I have a whole bunch of study Bibles and we try, we compare them all. We see what they all have to say and the verses they reference to and and, and uh, see what kind of understanding we can get. Maybe we agree, don't agree, um, or maybe we discover something that we didn't know before. So I think uh, all these I get off of like BibleGateway.com. I got like a, a subscription on there, four dollars a month. Really amazing because you get all of these resources. Oh, yeah, these, Bible is really good. Yeah, I got all of those uh, study Bibles, encyclopedias, Bible dictionaries, just commentaries. Yeah. Just I love it. So that's kind of where I'm getting all this stuff. So just so you know. All right, so I'll get started. Uh, Romans three, uh, verse twenty-one to twenty-six. All right, it says, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right. Any comments on that before we dive into some notes? I agree with it. <laughs> Amen. Well, first, let me go uh, to verse 21. See, we did this one last week. Just a little overview. Um, it says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So I just kind of want to do a little uh, exercise for us. So here's the Ten Commandments, <laughs> and uh, let's see if we're, we're if we're innocent or not here. It's a little exercise. So, <laughs> commandment number one: Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Have we like ever held up anything higher? I mean, any yes. <laughs> and number two: Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Yes. Um, so far, I'm, I'm guilty as well. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I'm mm -hmm. guilty. Super guilty. I used to think it was funny. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I was horrible. Mm -hmm. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And honor thy father and thy mother. I'm sorry, Mom. <laughs> She's going to watch yeah. this later. But uh, I know I'm guilty there. Thou shall not kill. Um, I think uh, Jesus even says if you're angry at someone, you could be a murderer in heart. So mm -hmm. I'm guilty there. 
improperly angry or allowed to go into a uh, an anger where you feel the need to be the one to do something. But it's got but it's improper. Like if you're righteously angry because this man's blaspheming God, it's a totally different thing. Sure, yeah, I got you there. And thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not kill. Yep. Well, I'm so far guilty. I guess, well, Jesus said, even if you looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you commit adultery. Right. So I was going to say, there, there's not one of these anyone has, any one of us is clear up. Right. It doesn't matter if physically done it. Jesus exegeted those texts, and he was like, look, if you do this in your mind, you are guilty of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thou shalt not steal. I'm, I'm guilty. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I mean, have you ever lied before, <laughs> you know? Uh, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. So if we compare ourselves to this, I think that we all fall short. And that's why we need Jesus. It should push us to the cross. It should push us to the cross where Jesus died for our sin, you know, and um, he paid the, the penalty. He took, the, he took the sin debt we had and put it on himself. And so that we could be righteous through him. You know, I mean, that's so why I praise God for Jesus Christ. All right, so this is our main text we're going to be looking at today. Romans 3, 22 to 23, it says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's a note on sin. It's a really large note. I'm not going to read it all, but I wanted to just hit on some, some things about sin, what it is, and stuff like that. Um, and these Greek words, I have no idea how to pronounce them right, but I'm going to say heide. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? Which, which word? I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, heide? I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but I butchered these words pretty good. Right, uh, so. Well, alpha and alpha and breath mark over both, so it would be a very it would be a hard A. All right, I'll just say hey day. <laughs> so, you gotta say both letters the same. <laughs> yeah. So the verb hey day carries the basic meaning of to miss the mark and by extension to sin. Mm -hmm. This is good notes. So I'm not gonna read them all. I just want to hit on some of these uh some of these, though. And Awen, uh, Awen refers in general to evil, sin, or wickedness. It may also describe the punishment or disaster that befalls those who practice wickedness. And then Awon is usually translated sin, guilt, wickedness, iniquity, and is one of the three primary words for sin in the Old Testament. An offense against God that ranges from willful rebellion to unintentional sins. Awon uh, usually has an ethical function, but it sometimes is a catch-all word to designate any sin against God. This word functions as the key word in the confession of, of sins, for it is the only term repeated as a summary word for the sins of the people. David twice uh, asked God to wash away or blot out his iniquity, and this is Psalm 51, which we kind of mentioned earlier already. And in Psalm 51, he acknowledges the root of his sinfulness goes back to his birth. So, yeah, we're a child of wrath by nature in Ephesians 2. Just kind of keeping an eye on the chat here. All right, so I'm going to, that's just a little overview, I think, of sin. All right, we'll go into the Bible studies now. So this one, the ESV, says, uh, This right standing with God is available to all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile, on the righteousness of God. See note on chapter 117. I got that down here. And then Romans 3.23 says, uh, No one can stake a claim to this righteousness based on his or her own obedience. For all people have sinned and fall short of what God demands. So Romans 1 uh, 
16 and 17 says, uh, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. All right, so here is a picture of fallen man and also the wrath of God that's revealed against fallen man. In Romans 1, 18 to 23, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. So there is the look at fallen man for you. Which uh, all, all of us at one time were, were this fallen man. Until the grace of God hits you. <laughs> Go back to 19 real quick. Sorry, I'm going to catch you on. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what be... Uh, yeah, thank you. That helps so much. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God is manifest. So... It doesn't say made in them or created in manifest, meaning it already existed. God's righteousness. It was already there. Like it just uh, just something to point out that it's uh, always been there and God is just passing it with that the communicable kind of I, I realized it's silly, but I just saw it and was like, oh man, I love that. Yeah, I mean uh something I kind of get from it is that God gave him a revel revelation about himself and they have no excuse uh, for not knowing God. Like just all of creation itself speaks the glory of God. So. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll be quiet. That's all good, man. Yeah. All right. John MacArthur. I like this study Bible. I like John MacArthur. Um, so there's no difference, the uh, glory of God, and uh, parenthetical comment e explaining that God can bestow his righteousness on all who believe, uh, Jew or Gentile, because all men without distinction fall miserably, fail miserably, miserably <laughs> to live up to the divine standard. And all have sinned. And then Paul has already made this case and from chapter one all the way to what we are now. Chapter 1, he was speaking of the Gentiles and exposing their sin. Chapter 2, he was speaking about the Jews and how they were trying to get right with God by the law. And then they try to make other people follow the law. And then they, they themselves can't even follow the law themselves. So they're like hypocrites. And and so they, he was exposing the, that they were all sinners. And then we come to the climax in chapter 3. Let me go over there. This is the climax of it all. <laughs> it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. The throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and they the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So I just take a look at that. It's like a mirror to myself and who I was before I was in Christ. Sounds an awful lot like I chose God of my own free will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got kicked out of servers for that, so. <laughs> I know. I was making fun of you just for that. <laughs> But yeah, it says uh, right here, you know, no one seeks after God and there's no one who understands and they have all turned aside and that's fallen man. 
that's the character. What's amazing about that is it the, the the logical conclusion when you when you see that and you're like, wait a second, no one seeks after God, but I sought after God. You have to ask that question. Like, wait, 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 what's going on there? Only by the grace of God did you. Right. Uh, the the Holy Spirit work in a person's heart, remove that heart of stone. Got my cage stage going on now, I guess. I'm gonna get you your cage stage. <laughs> All right, here's the next note. By the way, anybody else have any comments? I should check the chat here quick. Oh, sorry, crazy. You're not feeling good. I hope you feel better here. All right. I'm going to get um, the Reformation Study Bible here. One of my absolute favorites. If you're going to have a study Bible, that is the one I recommend to everybody. Yeah, I really do pay attention to this one quite a bit. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, so the law... Here, law is a reference to the Old Testament scriptures in general. Since Paul quotes, quotes come from Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Isaiah. Wait, am I on the right thing here? I am not. Sorry, guys. The Reformation's to your right. Okay, yeah, I skipped one here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh, okay. Let's just see you passed it. Yep, okay, we're on this one. All right, now I'm on track. So faith in uh, could also be translated the faithfulness of God, or faithfulness of, referring to Jesus' obedience to the will of the Father and going to the cross for a sinful humanity. But Paul's emphasis throughout this context of human believing, as in the case of Abraham in chapter 4, favors the NIV rendering. In this case, Paul adds the phrase, to all who believe. I think that's important. It falls on people who believe. To emphasize a key point in his argument, as all humans are caught up in sin, as God's righteousness is available for all humans, Jew and Gentile alike. All right, so this one... This note, Romans 5, 18 and 19, um, talking about Jesus' obedience made many righteous. It says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Uh, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. This is a good verse too, um, talking about the obedience of Christ. Um, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, it says, uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So yeah, he was obedient to the point of death, even mm -hmm. the death of the cross. That's amazing. What's what's interesting, like uh, since we were talking about doctrine earlier, on a, on a doctrinal side of this, when you're dealing with, you know, Jesus being co-equal in majesty, glory, um, being God, um, how do you take how do you take something that's perfect in all of itself and then make it less? You you add to it. So by taking on the likeness of men, 
he added to himself to lower himself. Hmm, that's interesting. I never heard it put like that. I just saw it and thought I'd point it out. Yeah, that's cool, man. I'm happy to. I love to hear what you guys have to say. Well, since no one else is talking. <laughs> they're here. They're here. I know. I see them. And they're just like lurking hard, man. That's all good. I'm just happy that we're digging in the word tonight and hopefully we're getting an understanding. All right. So this is the New King James Version Study Bible. And it says, God revealed to people how they should live, but no one can live up to that God, to God's perfect way. All have sinned. No one can live up to what God created us to be. We all fall short of his glory. We cannot save ourselves because as sinners, we can never meet God's require requirements. Our only hope is faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, that's straight to the point. Amen. Yep. Really want to tweak somebody out, tell them, yeah, we're saved by works. And then when they, just as you see them revving up to start calling you a heretic, you like the works of Christ, bro. <laughs> I think I said that in your uh, chat the other day. Yeah, uh, you did, actually. I, uh, but a bunch of reform guys know exactly what you're about to say. So. <laughs> I sent a video of, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, R.C. Sproul. I sent that to Terrazis the other day. and. I was had, so sad. It, it, I never got to meet him. Yeah, he he has a lot of a lot of good teachings, and one, at the end of one of his videos, he said that, and it really threw me off at at the start. And that's yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, he uh, that dude was great. So he discipled my pastor, so my current pastor, because I'm I'm Reformed Presbyterian, um, but, but I actually was Reformed Baptist for years. And then study of covenant theology and things like that led me into Presbyterianism. Um, but my first Reformed pastor was uh, discipled by Paul Washer. And then um, the one I'm under now was discipled by R.C. Sproul and uh, Steve Lawson. Guys like that. Oh, that's great. Those are great teachers. Yeah. yeah. He's, I, I was like, I don't know how I got, I mean, you know, you want to say the word lucky, but it's like providentially I've been under guys that have been trained by some of the greatest minds God has used it's i've been i've been blessed in that regard yeah um i as a christian like i i hardly ever use the word lucky anymore but i used to say that word all the time but now that i know who god is it's not lucky it's just his will yeah <laughs> luck chance they can, right. none of those things can exist in a universe with a sovereign god that's right amen Yeah, it's like when people deal with uh, like single when you start dealing with like the predestination debate, you know, because you're dealing as a Calvinist or, or a Reformed person, you know, whether you're just a particular or you're actually Reformed all the way, um, you start dealing with like, well, you know, how sovereign, like what level is he sovereign to deal with the salvation of someone? Is he is it single? Because you, you have these like levels of it's single, so it's like a passive and then double, so it's active active, and then you have uh, asymmetrical double and so which is where I personally fall but you know my my idea my thought on it was like, how can a sovereign God be passive in anything yeah um, he knows the beginning and the end I mean he already got it all written in his books well, like all is. the days of your life you know it's not that he knows the beginning he is the beginning and the end and it's right. not that he sees the future and then tell the prophecy is not him looking down time and telling us well this is what i saw no it's him looking down time or excuse me i just totally contradicted myself it's him showing us what he's going to do in time amen so he it's not uh i know the future because i saw it it's i know the future because i know what i'm going to do yeah he, he does as he pleases and it comes to pass <laughs> That's right. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. No one can stay his hand or say, why do you do these things? Yeah, he's not up there waiting for us to make decisions. So then he knows what to do. <laughs> no, right. Exactly. He's not. Uh, God is never reactive. 
um, he's immutable. So that comes down to actually, again, a doctrine. Um, when you start dealing with theology proper, you deal with his attributes, which is my favorite particular topic, but um, immutability. So uh, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. Um, and immutability is that doctrine. And so if God were to look down time, if he were to see who would choose him, quote unquote, and then he chose them because of that, that makes him reactive. It means he is learning. He is changing right. situations. So now he's no longer immutable. We've actually just destroyed the God doctrine as a whole. He's no longer God at that point. Um, I hear you. Right. He was the lamb victorious before the foundation of the world. He put the tree in the garden on for a reason, specifically for his glory, to show his glory in mercy and salvation of some and justice and wrath of others. This is all part of that plan. It's all part of him showing his attributes, communicable and non-communicable, to his beings. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, man. Yeah, right on. Created beings. I'm going to say created beings. <laughs> Yeah, the more so the more I learn about two o'clock this morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. The more I learn about who God really is, the more humbled I am, you know. And it's amazing what we can discover. And if you're not being humbled, then I don't know if you're learning about the real God. <laughs> I was studying something else the other day, not to like totally rabbit trail, but and all right. So you remember on the cross when he said he he was thirsty, and they gave him the uh, the sponge on the stick with the vinegar wine yep so i was doing a different study and ended up somehow study rabbit trailing into this but it turns out that when roman soldiers go out in the field they didn't have toilet paper per se what they had to clean themselves was was a sponge on a stick with vinegar wine for sanitation i had always thought they were just kind of you know being douchey oh here's vinegar wine that's funny because you know, it's not you know no no no. that was feces they put feces on our lord's lips and then yeah. he, right and then he turned around and blessed a man and said today you will be with me in paradise like right. this is our savior this is our god who with human feces on his lips is still saving us yeah wow that's incredible that and i remember him saying uh you know father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He was still having mercy right. to them on the cross, even as right. they were, you know, crucifying him. I mean, that's what could, that's. Crucifying. I mean, the, the sheer degradation, like crucify the worst way someone can die at that time. And then, you know, having feces put in his mouth. I didn't know about the feces part. I, that's the first I time I heard I that. Yeah, I didn't know that until like a week ago. And I was just like, how good are you? How amazing are you because if somebody was to even come near me like i i'm law enforcement i've literally had to dodge poop before and it's like i i immediately want to like tase somebody and he's just like blessed are you like it's so amazing grace and mercy wow right i mean the world doesn't understand love like that we're more like revenge and payback you know stuff like that but I mean, when you start learning about christ i mean and how we're supposed to even love our enemies. I mean, it's totally running the opposite way of the world. Dr. Whirl shared a verse, Colossians 3.12. It says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowel, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Great verse. Jesus is so beautiful. And Stephanie says, amen. Okay, okay, I'm going to keep going here. We're in the Reformation Study Bible. Okay, through faith in, in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Uh, the righteousness of God must be received now that it has been manifested. Uh, to believe, for Paul, involves no, knowledge of the gospel's content, mental assent to its testimony about Christ, and obedient trust and reliance on him as Savior and Lord. Uh, the righteousness of God is exclusively for those who have faith. And faith is a gift from God, by the way, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. That's right. Yep. I just 
Praise God. It's it's in Philippians as well. Oh, is it? Oh, I have to Mm -hmm. look that verse up too. Um, maybe someone can look it up and share it in the chat, but there is no distinction for all have sinned, whether Jew or Gentile. So faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 14 to 15 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. You know, there's something powerful about the word of God. When I was at the, my grandpa's funeral, that's kind of when the word of God spoke to me. I remember hearing verses, uh, What good is it that you gain the whole world and lose your soul? And and there's another verse, uh, store your treasure up in heaven, not here on earth. You know, those verses. And for some reason, those verses were speaking to me. And there's something behind the word of God. It's full of spirit and life. And it can come into a person and the grace hits you. And all of a sudden, you're following Jesus. And ever since then, um, he's never let go of me. And that was like maybe eight, eight years ago. I'm losing track of time now, but... Um, there's something about the word of God. When someone hears the gospel of, this, of their salvation, then they start trusting in it and their whole life turns around. Amen, brother. Looks like you found that verse late in uh, Philippians 1 it, 29. Yeah. For, it for it has been granted to you. Yep. For it has been granted to you. On Christ's behalf, to believe in Him. There it is. Um. Yeah, I mean, some people like. You ever seen the guys? They get saved on a Monday. By Sunday, they're they've memorized the whole Bible and they're ready to be martyrs. Those guys are annoying because that was definitely not me. <laughs> it took me years. Yeah, I mean, when I first uh, be, uh, started following Christ, uh, I didn't know anything really uh but i knew jesus was the way the truth and the life and then all of a sudden i started going to church and learning about the grace the grace just started pulling me in how he'd love a sinner like me you know and yeah oh i just i'm still in love with the grace all right uh fall short of the glory of god see original sin and total depravity um at psalm 51 a poignant description of the consequence of sin made in the image of the glorious God, Genesis 1. Uh, Humanity has exchanged God's glory for idolatry. We have already read that in Romans 1 already. And distorted the divine image. Now people are morally and spiritually ugly and depraved. Grace renews and restores humanity's lost glory in believers. So then he's going to go on and talk about how the grace actually re- renews and restores us and gives us a whole bunch of verses here. So we'll get into that. So original sin in Psalm 51. <laughs> like the third or fourth time that verse come up. Today. Hey, you know, it's a good one to keep in mind though. Um, mm-hmm. It says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me. I mean, this is the condition we we're in. Mm-hmm. I now mean, I, I do want to point out Um, This is just a a historical textual thing. I I don't hold to this, but this is something you may run into for everyone's knowledge. Um, There are some theologians, Bible scholars, textual critics, things like that, that do say they believe that this, because if you you look at David, he was, what, the seventh son? Um, when, When Jesse brought all of his other six sons before, um, these are my sons you know, and pick from them for your king. And he goes, don't you have another one? Well, yeah, I got the runt on the field, right? And uh, they they believe that, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. My mother cheated on daddy, and I belonged to somebody else. And that's what they believe this verse is saying. So just as oh. an FYI, there's, there's a large group of people that believe that. So. Yeah, let me. I'd, I'd like to throw my two cents. So, uh, I actually recently just came across this verse, um, reading about uh, original sin, and uh, 
they interpret uh, a Lutheran perspective is that uh, when they say uh, iniquity, they're talking about um, original sin and how we were all brought forth into original sin. Um, and not that so-and-so's wife cheated on them or, or whatever the case may like be. Like sin from Adam. Sin from Adam, yeah. That right. spread to all men. The, the federal headship. Yeah. Hey, I think we got verses coming up about that, I think. Oh, okay. Maybe in the next note, but yeah. Um, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Um, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so, man traded the glory of God for idolatry. In Romans 1.23, it says, And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. It's like we we traded the truth for a lie. Yeah. Well, it's the the first commandment that you shall have no other gods before me. And um, where is God? Right when you're dealing with His presence, He is omnipresent. So before Him means anywhere. You shall have no other gods of any kind. And John Calvin said, "We, our hearts are idle factories. We will create for ourselves other gods. Yeah. Just we, we breathe. And um, so it's it's that even for a saved man, you know, we constantly at war with ourselves to make sure that we don't put hobbies, work, money, family. Family can become idolatry. Heart. Yeah." Your children's schedules, your your spouse, your wife, your husband, all these things can easily become idolatry. They can take the place of God. It becomes that most important thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think when God's put in his proper place, everything else falls into place. Right. Okay, and uh, grace renews and restores humanity's lost glory in believers. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 49. Now, this verse is interesting. I think there, there's more understanding I need to get in it, but uh, maybe you guys see something that I don't see. But um, So it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. Excuse me. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. What kind of hope is that? I mean, we have... Uh, like the resurrection of our bodies. I mean, that's some hope right there. Um, it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. See, there's some spiritual body going on. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven and was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust. And as the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So that's an interesting verse right there. Well, he, he's talking about the difference between when you're your natural state, being born as a sinner in Adam, and then being born again in Christ. So it doesn't mean you literally have a different body. It is raised as a spiritual body. It's not saying you have a uh, another body, a second body in waiting. It's that the body you have will be clean. Like when it says, worship him in spirit and truth, um, you do that through through God, the, the things he's granted you. And so he will grant you that spiritual body, which is the current body every one of us is in now, but clean. We will be clean of sin. And sin has so permeated us that we don't even realize that we've never prayed a single prayer that has been sinless. We've never prayed 
we've never loved anyone that hasn't had some kind of selfish, sinful thing in it. Um, even God, which is why his grace is amazing because he covers all those things for us and his righteousness again being given to us. So when we are raised, when we die or he comes, whatever happens first, when we see him, we will be like him. We will be clean. We will be free of sin. And that's, that's what this is talking about. That freedom from sin being like him in that cleanness. I'm glad you clarified that. I, I took that to mean like we would have a second body, like a spiritual no, body, but no, uh, that, that's the, good. The spiritual body is the clean body. We, um, so I don't know what everybody's eschatological view is here, but I'm a millennial. So um, like when it talks about um, the new Jerusalem and things, I don't believe like that's a literal city. I believe that's an allegorical representation of the whole of the church. So gotcha. like, like revelation 21, 18 and the, the gates were as um, Jasper and the city itself was as gold, as pure as glass. So gold had gold is color because it's got impurities in it. But if you're looking at gold, that is pure as glass being see-through, meaning it is entirely and completely clean. There are no impurities in it. So we would say that that is the whole of the church, clean, purified of sin, like Christ in our sinlessness, because Christ has granted that to us. This is another way to say that. We are raised in a spiritual body. So the body we have now, free of sin. The thing I absolutely totally cannot wait for because I, I am so tired of being sinful. Me too, man. <laughs> yeah, amen. Yeah, um, and the Bible also says we're a new creation in Christ. And I think that new right. creation is, uh, it, it is what it is. It's a completely righteous and it can't be, uh, it doesn't sin. But then at the right. same time we have, we're living in a, uh, a, a body that has sin in it. And we fight right. against sin, but there is a part of us that is a new creation that can never be uh, tainted. Oh, absolutely. I think I believe yeah. that. Yeah. No, no, that's absolutely correct. The new creation, that new birth we see in John 3, you must be born again. Um, John Whitfield said it literally in every single sermon he ever preached. And he preached like 18,000 sermons in his life. You must be born again. And it, it's so important that that is right. emphasized. You must be born again because without that, there is no, there is no new anything. Right. You are made new in Christ because you were, there was something wrong with your first birth. You were born into sin. You were born into the first Adam. Being born again makes you born into the new Adam. The spiritual. The final, right. The final Adam. And, and it's physical, but they say spiritual because as we sit right now, it's, it is solely spiritual it's it's that doctrine of the already not yet we are already seated with christ in the heavenly places right not yet so it's already happened not yet which is it's a very very interesting concept but already but not yet we're we're just kind of waiting to catch up sort of I think we're going to get more into that and in, when we get deeper into romans especially like romans 6 i think uh and seven or something around there that talks a lot about i'm gonna I'll watch you cage stage really hard during Romans nine. Oh, okay you can let it out here it's all good man you know it, it, no worries um but yeah uh in ephesians 2 it says that we're dead in our sin and trespasses and um yeah two one yep and uh just thinking back to uh, genesis and when God said, you would surely die if you eat of that fruit of that tree. Well, they didn't physically die, but what happened was, I think, was a spiritual death right there. I think that's what happened. And then yeah. Ephesians 2, 1 says you're dead. You're, like, spiritually dead. And it says that he made you alive. And that I think that's referring to the new birth right there. What well, says you were? He's speaking to current believers. Right, right. So, but, but yeah, and the difference being is that when he was talking, when, when, when Jesus was talking to Adam in the garden, if you eat from this, you know, you, you will die. And yeah, he, he meant spiritually, because if, if he meant literally right then and there, then Adam and Eve both would have died right then and there. But there was that spiritual cutoff. They are no longer 
So they're flesh. <laughs> right. They the, the concept the, the, there's a lot of misconception there and and I fell into it too, but the idea being that they knew right from wrong suddenly. Well, yes, but also no. They they became the choosers of what was right and wrong for them after that sin. Because how many people do you know that are like, well, I know what's good for me. I know what's right for me. Well, you, you don't actually because of that first sin that we were all okay with. If you follow, there's a doctrine of being in Adam that um, it's a huge, and I don't know it that well. I've, I've looked through it, but it says we were there. We were with Adam when he made that decision. And so we became the choosers of what is right and wrong for us. Pretty much mm -hmm. becoming your own uh, God of your life. Yeah. And that's right. Uh, people think that's uh, freedom, but that's actually. Thank you. you. You put it in a way I was yeah, that, flopping on putting it. <laughs> that's how I lived before. You know, I was right. like my own boss and I was making my own rules and I was the God of my right. life and freedom. I'm free. Right. But actually what, right. what you really are is a, a slave to sin <laughs> and, you, and you don't see it. But the only, yeah, well, the they, only way they, that you could be set free from that is by the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. When, when they gained the ability to choose for themselves what was right and wrong for them, they did it in a sinful way. So therefore, they fell from that grace. They fell from that libertarian freedom that they have. Because there's only ever been three libertarian free people. Like I can say that we are free. We have free will, but we are free within our nature. Right. And our natures will always choose what it is most inclined to choose. So if you are dead in sin and trespass, even the good things you choose are evil. But if you are alive in Christ, then the good things you want the most are the things that are pleasing to the Lord to glorify him. Even though, because we have, for me, it was 30 years of habitual sin. I have habits. And things that, you know, through growing in grace and the spirit of God working on me through progressive sanctification, I'm, I'm, I've moved away from. I've put those things behind me. I've, it, but there are new sins that pop up. And that's just the world, the war and world we live in that we're constantly fighting sin. But they, because they, they gain that freedom to choose in sin, they're, for lack of a better term, choosers became broken. And so they will always choose wrongly and the bible says if it's not done in faith it is sin right so everything you do is sin without faith right i mean you can feed the dolphins take care of the cats feed the homeless people you know build hospitals the All right save the squirrels whatever it is and it's save the squirrels <laughs> you know i don't know man but whatever they're doing nowadays I, but they it's always sinful because it is always about you yeah, it's a pride thing. Exalting yourself. Yeah. Hearing an atheist in the world is still glorifying himself. Yeah, good talk, good discussion. Yes. Okay, well, I'm going to keep moving here, so maybe we can get through this tonight. There is, <laughs> so, Stephanie, there is a debate on what made in the image of God means. A bunny, it is a bunny trail. It's a good one, though. We should talk about that when we're done. All right, so uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 12 to 18, it says, uh, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Um, nevertheless, one, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed what, into the same image of the glory to same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord so i think it's just uh i think he's just trying to point out the grace of god that's transforming us 
by the Spirit of, of the Lord here. All right, Ephesians 4, 20 to 24 says, uh, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man. See, there's an old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man. See, there's a new man. We're a new creation, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This new man came by grace. Okay. Um, Philippians three seventeen to 21. Uh, let's see here. I think we're get mainly trying to point out 20 and 21, I think, and how God's transforming us into the image of Christ. But here we go. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Uh, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So this is another example on how the grace of God works in our life. What's up, All right, so Colossians uh, chapter 3, 8 to 11 says, uh, But now you yourselves are to put off these, uh, put, off, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, <laughs> blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So I heard somewhere, I think I think it was from John Piper. I like John Piper. And uh, he said that, see, we're already this new man. We're just becoming what we already are. I, I, I like that statement. Progressive sanctification. It's an right. amazing thing. I love this verse because it, it deals a lot with what's going on, like in the political realm of America right now, like with all the different race garbage and this, that, and the other. And this right here, it says there, there's no black, there's no white. There's no liberal, socialist, Democrat, Republican, conservative. There is Christ. <laughs> what, what it all boils <laughs> down to is that we're all sinners under the umbrella of Christ. <laughs> That's right. It's it's Christ is all and in all. It, just like stop. Stop with your trying to flip things. It's Christ, man. Right. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, it doesn't matter. You need Jesus. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so this uh here, uh my cage stage came out after reading this uh uh note and maybe you'll see what i'm talking about <laughs> as i read it here so um verse 21 told us that his this righteous salvation is not obtained on the basis of law keeping uh, now the apostle tells us how it is obtained through faith in jesus christ faith here means utter reliance on the living lord jesus christ as one's only savior from sin and one's only hope for heaven it is based on the revelation of the person and work of Christ as found in the Bible. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It demands the surest evidence and finds it in the infallible word of God. Faith is not illogical or unreasonable. What is more reasonable than that the creature should trust his creator? Uh, faith is not a meritous work by which a man earns or deserves salvation. Um, so far, I'm in agreement with most things here. But 
Uh, a man cannot boast because he has believed the Lord. He would be a fool not to believe him. Uh, faith is not an attempt to earn salvation, but it is the simple acceptance of the salvation which God offers as a free gift. So this is where my cage stage comes out here. <laughs> So what was the what was the issue there for you? Um, I guess uh, the the simple acceptance of the salvation. I I don't see man doing that without the spirit of God working in their life. Like a bad tree will only produce bad fruit mm -hmm. unless the spirit of God comes. Uh, man will naturally fall away. So I always try to exalt the grace of God. Coming oh, absolutely. But I think the... if you look at the, the, the line before it, faith is not a meritorious work by which man earns or deserves salvation. So they're saying you, you're, you're not doing it yourself anyway. You're just, when I, for me personally, when I read, but it's a, the simple acceptance. Like it's the simplest thing to get up and drink water because you're thirsty. Like you're doing this thing because it's so natural to you at this point. Like that's how I took it. Oh, sure. So I, I, you know, I didn't see it as a like, Oh, it's just a super simple thing. Well, I mean, I can see how that could be like, what do you mean it's so simple? Well, well I, I can see that. But I also see it being as, yeah, I mean, it, it just, it logically follows that if God has made you alive in Christ, it would be the next step. The simple acceptance of the salvation has been laid in front of you and you have been made able. Right. The, I think. So I, and that's just how I took it. Yeah, yeah. I'll read the next paragraph here. Paul goes on to tell us that the salvation is to all and on all who believe. It is to all in the sense that it is available to all, offered to all, and sufficient for all, but is only on those who believe. That it is, it is effective only on the lives of those who accept the Lord Jesus by a definite act of faith. Uh, the pardon is for all, but it becomes valid in an individual's life only when he accepts it. Mm -hmm. So I guess my argument is, uh, yeah, I think the without the spirit of God um, working in the man's heart, uh, right. that's kind of my my argument. Yeah, I mean the the offer of salvation goes out to everyone. So if you go to the street and you start proclaiming the gospel, that is literally God offering salvation to everyone that walks by. But only right. those who the Spirit has worked in will hear you. Yeah. In any real way. The sheep and then, will hear his voice. And yeah. then we, right, and we are responsible to respond to that. Now, some people do it very quickly, the annoying guys that are martyrs in a week, and then the rest of us <laughs> that take time, that, that have to be convicted of our sin, that have to feel that burden, that weight, and, and come to that realization, like, I can't do this. Like, I know I'm a sinner. I know there's something wrong with me, you know, and generally for a lot of us, that's where it starts. We just know we're wrong. And, and we just know that someone else has to fix this and we don't know how. And so that definite act of faith, accepting it, like years ago, that would have bothered me, you know, five years ago, that, that accepting it, that's man's, well, man does legitimately have a responsibility to accept, to recognize that there is that we have a will and and it has real consequences and so actually accepting that fully within ourselves there's there's a real thing there you know there is that real will that says i you know how many christians do you know that you're like and this dude is like about god bro this guy like knows so much stuff i mean and then like three weeks later you see him and he's like cheating on his wife or, or whatever it is he's like i don't know what happened and then he's in and he's out and he's up and he's down like that full-on acceptance that that recognition like i need this god i mean we have to do that and sometimes it's very slow for people sometimes sin you know john owen said be killing sin or it will be killing you um, but, but sin dies hard, flesh dies hard. And so sometimes, you know, it takes time. Yeah. It's not always easy. That's for sure. The, the battle's real. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, when Paul says that salvation is available to all, he includes Gentiles as well as Jews, because now there is no difference. The Jew has no special privilege in Gentile and the Gentile is at no disadvantage. 
Those are my cage stage notes, but I'm going to skip them for now. <laughs> is that what all the yellow is? Yeah, it's my cage stage, yeah. <laughs> uh, I could go over it if you want, but... Uh, I just ba- to, <laughs> I just basically uh, just saying how uh, I just think the spirit has to work in a man's heart. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, uh, and then like how the- there's no one who seeks after God, and like we've kind of discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. And by nature, we're children of wrath, and and sinners were blinded by the devil, and two Corinthians, and a natural mm-hmm. person does not accept the things of the spirit of God; they are foolish to him. You know. So those are my cage stage notes and. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean, so so, Mo, so how do you feel about the whosoever in John three sixteen? Like, since we're cage stage talking for a second. Oh, <laughs> I think he's talking about uh, be- who who believes. Right. So if you deal with it in the Greek, it, it, for God loved the world in this way. So there is no for God so loved the world, right? So loved the world, not this huge so. There is no so in the Greek. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So for everyone who believes, all the believing ones is is the literal Greek. All the believing ones. That's the way I see it too, yeah. Right. But if you read John 3 as a whole, you can read so and whoever, and it's totally fine. Because it doesn't move away from the rest of the context of three. You must be born again. What is ever born from spirit is spirit. What is born of earth is earth. You know, a bad paraphrase. But what's born here is here. What's born there is there. But you can't jump the fence. You must be born again. And no one can make Uh, themselves born again. That's all the work of God. You have... So you have as much to do with your second birth as you did with your first. Exactly. And as Jonathan Edwards said, the only thing you have to do with your salvation is the sin that made it necessary. Yeah, I can only bring your sin. Okay. Um, gonna keep. Stephanie asked the question. Oh, why do humans need to be blinded by the devil if they're already blinded by their sinful nature? Hey, I got some verses that might help uh, help us with that. Hold on. Well, I would ask the question, who is the God of this world? Who is, who is the Lord of sin? Yeah, the devil. Yeah. This is... Right. So their sinful natures are owned by the devil in, in, in a way. Here, here, so there's kind of a synonym thing going on there, but I think this is when they say blinded by their sinful natures, you have a natural sinful nature that is in you, but the devil is the Lord of that. Right. I think I got some verses that can illustrate this better for us. Uh, I'm glad I have right, this here. here. It says, uh, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. See, we were actually slaves of sin. Right. For he who has died has been freed from sin. See, Jesus is one that frees us from this uh, nature. And then uh, Romans 6.20, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, there it is again, you were free in regard to righteousness. So you weren't even thinking about, you know, serving God in this sinful nature here. We were yeah, slaves of sin. As John Bunyan said, you were unaware of your burden. Right, there's no guilt, you know, you just thought it was, you're just in love with sin. Um, even so, when we were we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So there's a bondage here that was that we were in. Um, and to Timothy it says, and that it was another word for slave. Yeah, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive. See, we were taken captive by him to do his will. So there's that. And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So hopefully those verses give us a better understanding of the condition. The, you know. Right. For those of us that are not Adam, Eve, or Jesus, we are only slaves. So saints, Christians, lovers of Christ, hear me. You are a slave even now. The difference being is you are a slave to Christ. That is a good place to be. Amen. And uh, 
yeah, I mean, he gifted us with this faith, and by grace through faith you've been saved, not by works. Oh, praise God. Okay, uh, let's see. Gosh, I think I was here. The availability of the gospel is, is as universal as the need. And the need is universal because all have sinned and all fall and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody sinned in Adam. When he sinned, he acted as a represent, representative for all his descendants. But men are not only sinners by nature. See, this is by nature. We're a child of wrath. They are also sinners by practice. They fall short in themselves of the glory of God. So, sin is any thought, word, or deed that falls short of the God's standard of holiness and perfection. It is a missing of the mark, a coming short of the target. An Indian whose arrow fell short of its target was heard to say, Oh, I sinned. In his language, the same word was used to express sinning and falling short of the target. Sin is lawlessness, the rebellion of the creature's will against the will of God. Um, sin is not only doing what is wrong, but the failure to do what is what one knows to be right. Whatever is not of faith is sin. This means that it is wrong for a man to do anything about which he has a reasonable doubt if he does not have a clear conscience about it, and yet goes ahead and does it, he is sinning. Uh, all unrighteousness is sin, and the thought of foolishness is sin. Sin begins in the mind. When encouraged and entertained, it breaks forth into an act, and the act leads on to death. Sin is often attractive when first contemplated, but hideous in retrospect. And sometimes Paul distinguishes between sins and sin. Sins refer to wrong things that we have done. Sin refers to our evil nature, that is, to what we are. What we are is a lot, lot worse than anything we have ever done, but Christ died for our evil nature, as well as for our evil deeds. God forgives our sins, but the Bible never speaks of his forgiving our sin. Instead, he condemns or judges sin in the flesh. So that made me think about something when I read that, is that uh, there was a price that was paid for our sin. It wasn't looked over. It was actually condemned and judged in the body of Christ. Um, there is also a difference between sin and transgression. Transgression is a violation of a known law. Stealing is basically sinful. It is wrong in itself, but stealing is also a transgression when there is a law that forbids it. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. And Paul has shown that all men have sinned and continually come short of God's glory. Now he goes on to present the remedy. So... Uh, you know how in the beginning it said uh, it's missing the mark. Sin is missing the mark. Yep. Yeah, um, hamar hamaria, the, the Greek word we get sin from, is actually an archery term. So to miss the mark, that's why it says it's missing the mark. It's an archery term from back then. But that's where the yep. entire term comes from. Yeah, I've heard that before too. Yep. Okay, 1 John 3, uh, 4 to 6 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, and you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or nor known him. James 4 says, uh, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Just pointing out the sin here. Whatever is not done in faith is sin. In Romans 14, 23, it says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Uh, 1 John 5, 16 and 17, If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about that. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. And uh, the planning of sin is foolishness. Uh, Proverbs 24, 9 says, The devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. All right, so any comments on all that? Went over a lot so far. <laughs> We're almost done. I mean, I, I mean, I agree with it. <laughs> Good. I hope we're getting understanding tonight. Yeah. No, no, I agree with this book. I like it. And Ecclesiastes seven twenty it says, Surely there is no righteous man on earth who doesn't who does good and never sins. Keep that in mind. Ah, oh, this is a cool commentary, Tony Evans. He he puts it in language that I think most people can understand. So uh, when Paul says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, he means all, no exceptions. And when, he, when the standard is God's glory, God's righteousness, it makes no difference if we miss it by an inch or a mile. If two men are running to catch a plane and one man is an hour late while the other is one minute late, who is in worse situation? After all, they both missed the flight. It doesn't matter if you are better than your neighbor. Your neighbor is not the standard. God is the standard, and we all fall short. That's a cool note, eh? Yeah, where'd you get that? Yeah, I like that. That was uh, Tony Evans' commentary. And this is uh, a different Bible study that's not on uh, Bible Gateway. It's kind of my own that I bought outside. Oh, okay. And the Moody commentary is really cool too because uh, the guy that made I this actually have that. Oh, it's great because I think he used to yeah. be a Jew, and so he has a lot of insight about the Jewish culture and, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I use it, but I'm careful with it because they're they're hyper, they're very dispensational. So I'm, I'm careful with certain things with them. Sure, I'm still learning what that is. So um, we can talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This will be our last note. Um, God's righteousness is through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, let's see here. Which could mean either the believer's faith in Jesus Christ, objective genitive. I'm not sure what genitive means. The traditional view or the faithfulness of Jesus in dying on the cross, subjective genitive. Does anyone know what genitive means? It's a part of grammar. Um, I only know it from studying other languages like German. <laughs> it's uh, it's relating to the nouns and the pronouns. Okay, yeah, I failed that class. Um, well, well, you're gonna if, when you go to start learning Greek, you're gonna have to get better with that language than with English. So, oh, it's gonna be rough. So, yeah, I know. Me too, man. <laughs> um, it's uh, basically words in like agreement with uh, with the word being used. Um, indicating like a that is like a possession or a closeness of association kind of thing. Okay. Um, the second view is not objectionable, uh, but it is not required by the syntax. Syntax. The traditional view is preferable. Usually, uh, faith refers to one's reliance upon another, and only when the context is explicit should the idea of faithfulness be ascribed to it. Also, several passages have a similar construction using the word faith, followed by a member of the Godhead in the genitive case, uh, where one's faith is directed toward the divine one, but not indicating the faith of the one who is divine. Uh, this suggests that the phrase faith of in Christ should be understood as having Jesus as the object of faith. Uh, in addition, the strong contextual evidence supports the view that this refers to the believer's faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, for all those who believe is not a redundancy if faith in Christ is an objective genitive. For this phrase gives the additional point that individuals from all people groups, Jews and Gentiles, for there is no distinction, can be saved by faith. The lack of distinction relates not only to salvation by faith in Christ, but to the consequences of sin as well. Fall short means uh, lack. The glory of God is sometimes connected by Paul both to God's revealed perfections and to his immortality. 
so that the lacking the glory of God here probably refers to God's Im immortal splendor forfeited by Adam and his descendants because of sin. But according to early uh, Judaism, Adam possessed special glory of his own as one made in the image of God, a special glory that he had lost at the fall and which God will restore to the righteous in the future. And the emphasis, however, is upon God's glory. So, all right, you know, I think that's all we're going to get to tonight. We're just a little over an hour. I try to keep it around an hour. So I think uh, that's all our notes. And I won't get into this one because there's so much to it over here. So we'll <laughs> save that for next time. So much reading. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of good information. I hope we all learned oh, yeah. something, you know, and I think we had a good conversation. Hope we, we got some understanding about it tonight. Yeah, I enjoyed this, man. It was good. So any last comments uh, before I say the Lord's Prayer? I always end in the Lord's Prayer. I just want to say uh, I appreciate you, Skill, as always, man, doing this for us. Oh, thanks, man. It's a pleasure. It's all for the glory of God. And I'm grateful that all you showed up tonight. There's a lot of things you could do on a Friday night. And I'm just thankful that you came out here and wanted to learn the word of God with me. I'm just very grateful. I appreciate you inviting me, man. This was enjoyable. I hope you come again, man. All right. I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>